Okay, brethren, when last we left our story, I had jumped the tracks. So we're going to put the train back on the tracks. In that, everything I told you was accurate, but I meant to be talking about verse 16 rather than verse 13, which we'll get to uh, in a moment with the third temptation. But verse 16 is what the Lord quotes after, in Matthew's order, the second temptation. When he's up at the pinnacle of the temple and Satan tells him to cast himself down. It's interesting that in Deuteronomy it's added, uh, the Lord didn't quote this part, as you tempted him in Massa. So it's looking backwards to a historical event in Israel and it takes us back to Exodus 17. Now I mentioned Exodus 16 before where the Israelites got out in the wilderness and they said, have you brought us out here to die in the wilderness of starvation? Now the Lord brought them food miraculously, and he's going to come back to that in Deuteronomy and talk about giving them the manna. But in any case, the Lord fed them, but in chapter 17, they realized they needed water as well. And remember, that was the story of the rock, and Moses was to smite the rock, and water came forth from the rock. That's what 1 Corinthians 10 refers to when it talks about they drank of that spiritual rock which followed them, and that rock was Christ. So even though there were about two million, some estimate, among the Israelites in the desert, God miraculously fed and miraculously gave them a drink. But at Massa, again, they tempted the Lord in this sense. They impugned the Lord's goodness. They questioned whether God really loved them and implied that he sadistically wanted to kill them of thirst. And so they were demanding God to do something, which God was going to do for them anyway, of course, but they were demanding in their own way. And God isn't the genie in the bottle, brethren. You know, we don't rub the lamp and get our three wishes. God isn't there at our beck and call. There's, of course, a certain school of theology, a school of thinking, that says you've got to demand from God, and you've got to name and claim it. If you can just think it and tell God it, it'll happen. Well, that is, again, more in common with magic, with demonism, with false religion, and very ancient lies, but not biblical Christianity. God is our Father. God knows what we need before we ask Him, and God bids us come in simplicity not in the endless multiplication of words, vain repetitions like the heathen, not with special incantations and formula, but God would have us come and just say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Give us this day our daily bread, and so forth. To ask God directly, in other words, as his children, for what we need. Now, God is in the driver's seat. We are not. God is not there, as so many treat him. They say, you know, when things get rough, we can turn to God. That It's sort of like the fire extinguishers you see around. In some buildings, they say, in case of emergency, break glass. They've got the fire extinguisher in there. You break the glass, you pull it out, or maybe it's a fire hose, and you can put out the fire. That's not how God wants to be in our lives. He's not just the God of the emergency or the God of the occasional need, and he's certainly not Santa Claus, who we come with our grocery list and tell God, now I want this, 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 and this. In Jesus' name I, I pray, amen. The good book I read on prayer a while back, uh, it's a brother who would hold doctrines I don't necessarily agree with in every point. He's very reformed. But the title of the book was called Praying Backwards. And unless you think that's some kind of weird neo-Buddhist technique or something, but what he meant by it was, that often when we pray, we're accustomed to say at the end of the prayer, in Jesus' name I pray. And that's sort of like saying abracadabra, you know? It's like saying to God, all right, I told you what to do, now go do it. He said it would be better if we prayed, Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name. Father, we come in Jesus' name. Because you're remembering that you're approaching God through Christ in his authority. And so what you pray for has to be consonant with that authority. It has to be in accord with God's will, that you're praying for what God wants you to have, or if you don't know what that is, 
that you're praying at least your will be done. So it's always with the understanding, God, I'm asking you for this, but if this is not really your will, not what's good for your work and your glory and me, then don't give it to me, you know? Help me to pray for the best things. Help me to learn how to ask for the good things. So in that sense, it's praying backwards, putting Jesus at the beginning, not the end. Now, I'm not being legalistic about where you put the name of the Lord in your prayer, but it is a helpful reminder that we're approaching God as suppliants. We are asking for something. We are beggars coming to the one who's rich. And that anything God gives us is, of course, because he's faithful and good, but also because he's gracious. Never because we deserve it. Always because of his grace, and that grace is given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit. So they, Satan was wanting the Lord to put God in that place of being the servant rather than the master, of being the means of doing some powerful work. And by the way, the temptation in a lot of circles today is to try and do this with the Holy Spirit. It's not that people try to tempt the Father so much, but they try to tempt the Spirit in the sense that they think whatever I ask the Spirit to do, he should do for me. So if I ask the Spirit for some miraculous power or miraculous occurrence, the Spirit is at my beck and call. I can control the Holy Spirit. No, 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 folks. We are to be filled with the Spirit. That's uh, what a Christian is to be. And you notice that phrase, filled with the Spirit, when you follow that through the New Testament, the evidence of someone being filled with the Spirit is it comes out in their talk, in their preaching. That being filled with the Spirit was someone who could then, like Stephen or like Paul many times, preach the Word, preach it faithfully, preach it well. Not something dramatic and supernatural that people are looking for today. Oh, show us the big dynamic thing. Everybody wants the next David Copperfield, Lance Burton, David Blaine, whomever it is. We don't want to be a Christian one of those, okay? As much as I enjoy a leisure domain, you know, kind of cool to be tricked by those illusionists and figure out how did that guy make the Statue of Liberty disappear and all that kind of stuff. I get it. It's entertaining. But in God's things, it's rubbish. That's not what we're doing. We're not commanding the Spirit to do anything. The Spirit has to control us. And he never does that, by the way, by making us out of our minds. When you see people controlled by God's Spirit in the Bible, they're always in possession of their faculties. As 1 Corinthians 14 says, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. So it saves us from a lot of error if we just get some of these basic principles down and understanding our role versus God's role. And the Lord Jesus, above all, understood that. He was willing to be thirsty if it was God's will for him to be thirsty, or hungry if it were God's will for him to be hungry. He wasn't placing demands on God, and his presence out there in the wilderness was, of course, indicative of that. Now, verse 17, or sorry, let me back up and do 13 while we're here. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. And you'll find, especially in this part of Deuteronomy in chapters 6 through 11, there's a lot of repetition. But you'll find the best preachers do that, that they keep reiterating. because. I would like to think that every single word that drops from my lips is a pearl that you're going to treasure in your heart forever, okay? And that everything I've carefully slaved over studying and preparing and planning, that once I share it with you, it's locked away in your mind forever. But in, you know, 20 some years of preaching God's word, that's not the case. And how many messages have I heard and God has to keep telling me some of the same things. Because again, we forget, or we don't get it the first time. We don't understand it fully. So there has to be repetition. And he keeps coming back to certain fundamentals. Who God is has to be center. And don't turn to the idols. So this command in verse 13, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall take oaths in his name. 
And we noted that over in chapter 10, verse 20, the wording is almost identical. This is what the Lord quotes after the third temptation. Now, what is the third temptation? At least in the Matthew order, the order is slightly different in Luke. Number two and number three are switched in Luke, but we'll go with Matthew's because it's the one I'm most familiar with. In Matthew, Satan takes the Lord and he shows him the kingdoms of this world in their glory. One of the gospels says, in a moment of time. That's good. Because when the kingdoms of this world reach their zenith, they have a kind of a glory, but it's a fading glory, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't last. We can look back, and even historians used to be want, they don't so much anymore, but they would talk about the golden age of Rome or the golden age of Greece because they recognized there was kind of this upward trajectory of culture and civilization and power and influence. And you might get Greece coming to the apex of that, say, uh, about 400 years before the time of Christ, and they've got Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and Democritus and people like this. And then they go down so that when you come to Acts chapter 17 and Paul's on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, Athens still has that reputation of being this great city of philosophy and learning, but it's not what it used to be. It's not what it was in Socrates and Plato's day. They've come down a bit, and yet God is still reaching out there with the word. Kind of like today, people still refer to Paris as the city of light, and they talk about the great artists and writers of the past, and particularly that lost generation that came to Paris in the 20s after World War I, Ezra Pound and F. Scott Fitzgerald and uh, Gertrude Stein and Alexis B. Toklas and Hemingway and all those sorts of people. Uh, but I'm not sure there's the same level over there, although the French are very proud of their intellectual heritage, so maybe they differ with me. But thanks to Jacques Derrida, and thanks to Michel Foucault, and thanks to other postmodern deconstructionist philosophers, they don't believe in truth anymore. They're totally relativistic. They don't believe in the traditional concepts of art being about beauty and being about reflecting the world as it is. So I think they shoot themselves in the foot thereby. And it's not just Paris. We could say New York or London or many other cities of the world the same way. Because of these philosophies, we don't see the flourishing of the culture that they once had. And that not all that culture was good anyway, but I'm just saying. In any case, Satan shows the Lord these cities and their glory in a moment of time and says, all these things I will give to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, not to put too much freight on a tense, but the scholars tell us there that the tense is the aorist tense. And the implication is just bow down to me one time. That's all you have to do. And you'll have all of these cities of the world. Now, Satan has power in this world. The Lord himself called him the ruler of this world. He said that a couple times in the Gospel of John, such as in John 14. Later in 2 Corinthians, he's called the God of this world. Not because he's actually a God in the sense that we understand who God is, but men give him worship and allegiance the way they do to a God, right? So when we talk about man's religion apart from Christ and what man thinks of God or a superior being, it's really Satan blinding their minds, blinding their minds in different ways. It exhibits itself in all these different religions and worldviews or even irreligion, atheism and agnosticism, as John Lennox has so often pointed out, are really belief systems themselves. They're faith systems because you need to have faith to be an atheist. Uh, Geisler, who wrote a book some years ago, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And uh, I think that's right. I think his co-author was Frank Turek from New Jersey. But it's a belief system too. And Satan has power. He can give people things. You look at some of the people who have gotten to the top of the entertainment world and gotten to the top of the political world. And you say, how in the world did he or she get there. I mean, sure, they have some talent in a certain way, but no more so than a lot of other people, you know, in the same field. And there are other people that would seem, from the character standpoint, to be much better. 
how did this person get to the top? You say, well, give me an example, Keith. Okay, Adolf Hitler. Now, we can all agree that that guy became a powerful guy. But how did he become a powerful guy? You read his biography, he was a loser. We're talking capital L for those at home watching on the video, okay? That guy failed at everything he tried. Failed out of art school. Gets a, an investigative journalism assignment, gonna to try to be a reporter, infiltrate this extreme party, the National German Workers, Socialist German Workers Party, and he's going to find out uh, what that's all about. He ends up joining them. And that's where his star really starts to rise. Nazi is an acronym for that party. Anyway, he starts to rise. He becomes a leader in that party, not the only leader initially. There are other people like Ernst Röhm, and Rome is a tougher guy in certain ways. Rome is a real gangster type. And yet, when it comes to the Night of Long Knives, it's not Hitler getting the shiv, pardon my prison jargon, but it's Ernst Röhm who gets killed. It's his uh, people. It's the rivals that Hitler has to power. And the guy who, in 1925, writes Mein Kampf, My Struggle, and sort of tells what he's going to do when he gets in power and how Germany ought to be and how he's going to establish a Reich that's going to last for a thousand years, hardly anybody pays attention to it because Germany is a defeated country. They are, their economy is ruined by World War I and the reparations that followed, and they don't have respect in the world, and they're now kind of a banana republic, if you'll forget the expression, of Europe, you know, not a very respected place. And people are thinking Germany's a bunch of has-beens, and nobody hardly at all is paying attention. Winston Churchill was, but people weren't listening yet. And uh, other people were too, and people weren't listening. But by 1932, the man is the chancellor of Germany. He's in the most powerful position in that country. Now, you have to understand Germany, before World War II, produced more Nobel laureates than any other country, more Nobel Prize winners. They had world-class universities. People from America, from the mid-1800s through the mid, early to mid-20th century, would go to Berlin, would go to Tübingen, would go to Heidelberg, would go to Marburg, would go to Wittenberg, would go wherever, to these different university cities in Germany, and they would study there, and they would do graduate work, not only in the sciences, but in theology, archeology, span Egyptology, linguistics, anthropology, you name it. Germany was like, had all these brainy people. They had one of the highest literacy rates in the world. All kinds of extremely educated people. And yet, this guy, who himself has never really accomplished anything in school, isn't the smartest guy around. He, through his oratory and through the evil doctrines that people wanted to believe, he becomes the most powerful leader in this country. Now, don't get me wrong. There were a lot of other bums in Germany in the 1920s. The 20s was a story of street fights and what we're seeing happening in Kenosha and Seattle and New York and other places. This was happening in Germany, the socialists and the fascists fighting one another and everybody trying to prevail. And it's Hitler, and there were many other groups of fascists, by the way, but it's Hitler who comes out on top. How does that happen? And how is it that, that man getting the, to the top of Germany is able to rearm Germany and get the Sudetenland and Alsace and Lorraine and Czechoslovakia, and then in 19th September of 39, invade Poland. And I think today might be the anniversary of that invasion, but I'm not sure, I'll look that up. In any case, invade Poland and start a war that globally kills somewhere between 55 and 80 million people. Nobody's sure how many. How did that happen? I'll tell you how it happened, Satan. Satan pushed that man up. You read his life. He was a devotee of Madame Blavatsky. He was into spiritualism. In other words, you read sometimes people say he was a Catholic because his parents were Catholic. When he was born, he was christened in the Catholic Church. But his own secretary would say, no, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. But he did believe in the occult. He believed in spirits. Then you read a book like 
Erwin Lutzer's book about Hitler's cross, which is excellent. And he and all the top people around him were heavy into spiritualism. Horoscopes, seances, some of them, like Hitler, were heavy into drugs as well, which can open you up to the spirit world in a different way. These were people that were influenced by the devil. Now, people in our world laugh at that, of course. But to me, it's the only explanation. And that there's no human explanation for Hitler coming to power and doing what he did and having the control over millions of people if there's not a spiritual element to that. You can't explain Stalin. You can't explain Mao Zedong. You can't explain Pol Pot. You know, all of these people had their part to play and were used one way or another by Satan because Satan is still ready to promote people in this world to places of power and influence if they will give themselves over to him for his use. And I'm not saying they do it knowingly, but they open themselves up to the spirit world thinking they're, they're going to get power that way, or they open themselves up to a course of action, and Satan exploits that. So he says to the Lord, just bow down to me once, and I'll give you all this. Now imagine, that's the crown without the cross, isn't it? That's achieving world sovereignty without having to go and die to redeem the world. The Lord uh, could have done that, you know, but the Lord refused to do that. Why did the Lord refuse to do that? Because his allegiance was, verse 13, you shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and take oaths in his name. And it says in Matthew, the way it's worded there, you shall worship the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. See, there's only one being that is really worthy of being worshipped. That's God. And the Son of the Father, the one who himself was God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, Always recognize that, that the one who you had to give ultimate allegiance to, to love with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that was none other than his father. And the Lord Jesus as a man was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, wasn't he, in Philippians 2. In other words, this commitment to worship and serve the Lord was so much so that the Lord Jesus would do it even by going to the cross and suffering what he did there. One of our hymns says, Lord, even to death, thy love could go. Well, indeed. And we could say, even to death, thy worship could go. That it used to be in the old marital vows, uh, people would say, with my body, I thee worship. Well, the Lord didn't get married while he was here on earth, but there was never anyone with his body who worshiped his father more than he that wherever his feet went, now I'm going to get in trouble. You remember that old Sunday school song, Be Careful Little Feet Where You Go? Well, with respect, the feet of our Lord never went anywhere that he should not go. The eyes of our Lord never beheld iniquity with any approval. The ears of our Lord never intentionally listened to evil and approved of it. The tongue of our Lord never spoke anything that he had to attract, retract or take back or say, I shouldn't have said that. The Lord Jesus was fully committed in every respect. We see it in Leviticus 2, the meal offering, that he was that fine flower, smooth, unadulterated, anointed with that oil, the one whom the spirit was given to him without measure because finally there was a man that the Spirit could fill entirely and perpetually. There's never been a man that the Spirit of God could come upon and have instant and continual access to every part of that man, full stop. Only the Lord Jesus could do that. It was like the dove that Noah sent out, that the dove found no place to rest its feet because the dove won't rest on anything to do with death and corruption. Those are the fruit of sin. But how did the Holy Spirit come upon the Lord at the baptism visibly? He came upon him in the form of a dove, the Bible says. And here was the one on whom the Spirit could rest with approval. There was never any dissonance between Son and Spirit. And there was never any disunity or lack of harmony between the Son and the Father. There was only obedience, only that continual doing of the Father's will. 
so much so that our Lord could pray in John 17, Father, I have done the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, none of us could ever say of our life for God, mission accomplished. There's always going to be something we can look back and say, well, I missed an opportunity, or I shouldn't have done this or that. There's always going to be regret in that sense, isn't there? I'm not saying there aren't things we can do. The Lord does use us by his grace, and wonder of wonders by his grace, one day he'll reward us for how he's used us. But in the Lord Jesus' case, there was nothing that God wanted him to do that he left undone. And there was nothing that he should not have done that he had done. There was perfect obedience. There was this continual worship and this absolute loyalty to the Father. That even though submission to the Father, obedience to the Father, meant the death of the cross, not just physical death, not just the human factor of psychological torment and physical pain, not just the rejection of his fellow man, not just the loss of everything, becoming absolutely bankrupt in this world, but spiritually being made sin for us. That is having our sin and iniquity laid on him and the wrath of God poured out in his fullness. All thy waves and thy billows have gone over me in the language of Psalm 40, I think it's verse seven. And this was what the Lord Jesus did because he was continually devoted to his father and went all the way to Calvary and did exactly what the Father went. And so he was raised up by the glory of the Father. You know, one day the Lord is going to have all the kingdoms of this world. Revelation speaks about the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. One day the Lord Jesus shall reign over it as King of kings and Lord of lords. But there are so many people in history and even in contemporary scenes that if truth were known, They've had to compromise to get their power. They've had to do things they knew weren't right. Even people that wanted to do good things, that wanted to be righteous, that wanted to be a ruler who served the people. I know we can be cynical about leadership, but there are such people. There are people that want to help others. There are people that want to make things better. But so often in our world, to get to the top, you have to make decisions along the way that are compromises, that are things that are sinful, things that really, in the end, end up making you not what you could be as a leader. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes and rules over everything, there's the assurance that he has not compromised to get there, that there's nothing he did. There was no shortcut to power. There was no taking the easy road that he has every right to sit on the throne of his father, David, not only because he bears the right human lineage coming through Joseph and Mary down from David, not only does he have that, that uh, I mean, legally through Joseph, physically through Mary is what I mean to say. Not only does he have the right pedigree, we might say, but he also has the right character. The one who always did what pleased the father and the father can truly say, like he said of David, but in the case of the Lord Jesus, we say all the more so, he um, is the one who is the man after my own heart. This is the one who thinks like I think, who loves what I love, who hates what I hate. This is the one who shall do all my will. And wonder of wonders, when the Lord Jesus achieves absolute power and all enemies are put under his feet, 1 Corinthians 15 says, he delivers up the kingdom to his father that God may be all in all. I've probably said it to you before, but you know the famous political science axiom by Lord Acton, that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely? Well, the Lord Jesus is accepted from Lord Acton's principle because he is not corrupted by power. And when he achieves absolute power, he will willingly relinquish it to his father. He willingly gives it to him. Think of it. Adam did not want to relinquish the ultimate power and authority to God. He wanted to reserve a little for himself. I can decide in this thing. I can take of this tree, and I'll make my own way. And that was the way of folly and perdition, wasn't it? Satan did not want to relinquish power and position and glory. I will ascend. I will be like the most high. 
I will be great. It's all about him, his three favorite people, me, myself, and I, right? And that's so much what we are as fallen human beings, too. But the Lord Jesus, who had heaven's glory, he did not consider that something to be grasped at and held on to. Though he was in the form of God from all eternity, that's what, what he was intrinsically, always. Nevertheless, he didn't stay in the invulnerable sanctum of heaven, where man couldn't spit on him, where no creature dare revile him, where no aspersions could be cast on his character, where no brick bats or slings or stones could be rallied against the Lord. Our Lord would come forth from that place where the living creatures adored him, where the seraphim cried, holy, 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 where the cherubim wouldn't even look at his unveiled glory. They would veil their faces with their wings. With all of those archangels and angels doing all of his will, his every command, his every whim and wish, and the Lord would step out of that glory of heaven. We sang it. He left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself in matchless love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. The one who was willing to give up all glory and power would one day take all glory and power again. Isn't that amazing? The Lord came from glory in Philippians 2, says he went down, 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 a bond slave, the true servant of the Lord, the one found in fashion as a man who can understand the condescension. What is it like to be God, a spirit, and yet then to take on this mortal coil to become like us? That is such a step down. That is such an infinite chasm that has been gone by. And then becoming a man, going all the way to death and being reckoned like sin for us, becoming that sin offering. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. See, that's the way to power, isn't it, brothers? The way up is to go down. The way to gain this world is to submit to the Father. Because the Father is the one who works all things after the counsel of his own will. This is my Father's world, the hymn writer said. And the Father is going to give it to whom he will. And who better to give it to, to administer and to make it flourish, then the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will do it. Because he was the one who always worshipped and served the Father and never wavered in that course of loyalty. Now, therefore, that was a principle for them in the land, that Israel was to serve the Lord and not idols. And the Lord Jesus, in that sense, is the premier Israelite. He is the fulfillment of what Israel was meant to be. And we could say the Lord Jesus is the best Christian, too, in a sense, right? That what we are to be is like Christ. He is our model. He is our standard. That everything God tells us to be is what the Lord Jesus Christ already is in perfection. And so he becomes the great model for us. Now, they were warned against idols. They were to Keep the Lord in this supreme place. And it says in verse 18, You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may be, go in and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. So again, this is the reiterating theme, reoccurring theme, that this is the good land. And God wants to give you this for your prosperity. Now it's, of course, in these verses and earlier, we have the contemplation of passing down the truth to the next generation. Verse 20, when your son asks you in time to come saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we're careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. Now, 
it makes me think of the tremendous responsibility we have. Like the Israelites, God wanted this truth to be passed on. And we have to be intentional about that. And it has to be something purposefully done. That our homes ought to be a place where the word of God is read and where prayers are offered in the family. Now, you might live alone. You might be a single person. So it becomes a little bit simpler in a certain way when you're at home. But that doesn't remove from you the responsibility that you have an influence on other people. You have an influence on believers that are younger in the faith at your local church. Or there might be believers that are not only younger in the faith, but they're younger than you chronologically. Think about the children and the adolescents growing up in your assembly. They are getting bombarded constantly with this world, aren't they? That all over, now more than ever in history, we have all this media. I don't mean the New York Times and Newsweek and whatever. What I mean by media is an avenue of disseminating information. That we have the World Wide Web. And with a few clicks and pointing and uh, a few search words or whatever, they can access virtually any kind of information, any kind of data. They can see all kinds of images. They can get all kinds of ideas. They can have philosophies and religions. Some things that we thought died out years ago can be brought back by the internet. I ran into uh, some time ago some believers that had fallen into the error of polygamy, and they believed in Christian polygamy. And I thought, man, you know, I never would have thought in my lifetime that we had to address this in the United States of America. I mean, the missionaries did when they went to certain parts of the world with the gospel for the first time in modern times. They had to deal with that. But somebody that was a professing evangelical believer that was raised with the Bible would suddenly say that this was the right thing before God, that you should have multiple wives. And of course, it comes back to lust. Let's call it what it is. It's not about the word of God. It's not about trying to be loyal to God. It's trying to gratify our lusts and feel religious while we're doing, doing it, at least in the case of these people that are bringing this stuff back. And I don't think it has widespread traction. I'm not saying you should worry about it. But with all of the stuff that the world is shouting at our young people today all over. And all the things they're hearing from their friends, we really have to push back. And we push back not by locking down their access to information or taking them out of the world. That's an impossibility, really. What we have to do, rather, is counter it by giving the word of God. You might say, well, my gift isn't Bible teaching, Keith, or my gift isn't preaching. Uh, we're not talking about preaching and teaching. We're talking about what you know from the Word of God, passing it on to others. And it wasn't the expectation in Israel that everybody would publicly function as a priest. They didn't have the priesthood of all believers the way God wanted them to have. He wanted to make them a kingdom of priests, Exodus 19 says. But in a point of fact, through their sin and their limitation, it ended up becoming just one family in one tribe. The sons of Aaron from the tribe of Levi became the priests. We live in the age when all believers are priests. In 1 Peter 2 and Revelation 1 would bring out that truth among other places for us. But not everybody was going to be of the sons of Aaron. Not everybody was going to go serve at the tabernacle or later at the temple. Not everybody was going to be a prophet who would be raised up by God to go out and speak his word. But the assumption was that every Israelite father was going to pass on the truth to his children. That was going to tell them why they believe what they believe. The history that lay behind it. Not just these are my opinions or these are the traditions we've received. But this is what the Lord did for us. And the Lord delivered us this word. And that's why we hold to it. Even before I was married, I used to talked to older brothers who had been in the work much longer than I had. And one thing that struck me about some of these guys, and they were a great generation of workers who were mightily used to the Lord, many of them mightily used in evangelism, seeing lots and lots of people saved and seeing assemblies planted. And they did a work, a good work for God. 
and it's up to the Lord at the judgment seat to ultimately determine the value and the reward and all of that. So don't hear this as a criticism. I'll only tell you that from their own lips, I had more than one tell me that the thing they regretted most was that they didn't spend more time with their families. And by spending more time with their families, they didn't mean taking them to play tennis or go kayaking or taking them to a ball game. Not that there's anything wrong with those things in and of themselves. But their point was, in some of their cases, their children hadn't gone on and embraced the truth that they held so dear. Now, on the one hand, we can't make anybody believe. And John 1 is pretty clear about that, that it's not of the will of flesh, it's not of the will of man, it's not of blood, is it? That we can't, in other words, by heredity, guarantee that our children or anybody related to us is going to become a believer. There's no automatic formula. And it's not by natural generation. You must be born again, John 3 says. And we know that's an individual spiritual decision. There has to be repentance and faith towards God by that person. But having said that, how should they believe without a preacher? Is what Romans 10 asks. And if we're not telling them the word, how do we expect them to believe the word? Now, again, I know the sovereignty of God, and I've met kids that were raised in atheist homes, and God gets the word to them some way, somehow, and they believe and get saved. Praise God. But there's no excuse for us in Christian homes to have people in our home circle that we're not conveying to them the truth in a regular and systematic fashion. Now, one thing Naomi and I determined when we got married, not that we're anything, but having learned from those older brethren, I said, Lord, wherever you use me, I don't want that to be me. I don't want my children to be unbelieving because I didn't preach to them. If they hear the word and decide to reject it, well, I can't change that, obviously. But on the other hand, I want to be there to give the word. And that's one of the reasons, the major reason, in fact, why my children and my family travels with me. And why, since they were babies, I've literally drugged them all over the world. And it has been hard on my wife, okay? Naomi has sacrificed a great deal. And she's done it willingly because she sees the value of it, too. Of us being with them and teaching them the word and exposing them to Christians and exposing them to the word of God around the world. And we pray for them. And if you ever pray for us, Please pray for our children. Pray for them each to be saved. They would all profess to one degree or another, but we've seen a lot of children profess through the years, and we've seen children go by the wayside. So God knows if any of them or all of them are saved right now, but we ask you to continue to pray for them. In any case, it's a sad thing, isn't it? When you have someone whom the Lord gives in evangelism or gifts in Bible teaching, and they are greatly used to benefit the church, but their own children don't believe. You know, you could pick out people from history. I almost don't want to because it's too painful, but J.C. Ryle, who was one of the great commentators and theology book writers of the 1800s, a lot of his stuff still worth reading. You gotta spit out some reformed bones, but you know, he had a great appreciation for the gospel and for the Lord Jesus Christ, so I value him. But his son, Henry Ryle was an un, not an un, well, maybe he was an unbeliever, I, I don't know for sure, but he was certainly a man who was theologically liberal, a man who didn't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, thought the Bible contained mistakes and had a lot of man in it, and the son was not the same stamp as the father. Again, that's such a tragic thing when you see that, that the parents have been strong for the Lord but the children don't go on in it. Again, sometimes they're faithful parents and they have presented the word and the children rebel and reject it. We know the story of the prodigal son, right? And there's no fault put on the father. So if there's somebody here and your son or daughter or maybe multiple children aren't going on for the Lord, I'm not picking on you, I'm not slamming you. I'm not saying that can't happen to anyone. After all, God is the best father of all. And he's got billions 
of wayward preachers. We wouldn't call them as children, because to become a child of God, you've got to receive Christ. But in a sense, they're his offspring, Acts 17 says. And God presents them with the truth, and they reject it. So in the sense, there is individual responsibility. But what I'm just trying to convey is it is so important for us to pass on the truth. Now, in Israel, where we're reading, this is put in the home. But it certainly goes for the local assembly, too, doesn't it? And what could we say we're teaching our young people? Are we grounding them in the truth? And a lot of places, you know, honestly, it's haphazard. There's not any kind of plan. Not, believe me, I believe in the leading of the Spirit. And I'm not saying you tell brethren what to speak on at every meeting. But there ought to be times in the assembly when you're systematically going through the doctrines of the faith. When you're explaining what the faith is. When you're explaining who the Lord is. And this isn't just a problem in assemblies. You read uh, blogs from other preachers, from other groups of Christians. And they'll all talk about how they have young people that grow up going to the church and being involved in all the activities of the church. And then they go away to college and they're AWOL. You don't hear from them again. And some of this is, I think, because they haven't been properly grounded. And we need to get back to that systematic explaining of the word. Then you have some kids that there's just no doing anything with them. They come in the middle of your message and they take things out of your computer back, you know. <laughs> just kidding, my guy. I love you. <laughs> anyway, I think you brethren know where I'm going with that. And again, I think I'm preaching to the choir. But we have to be very intentional about this, not just assume that the kids will pick it up. I was a self-starter, okay? Not that it was me myself. I look back and God put it in my heart. He stirred me up when I was young, when I was 13, 14, to get serious about his things and to seriously pour myself into the word of God. And I tell people when I go place with young people, I say, what you are going to be for God in five or 10 years, if the Lord doesn't come, is largely dependent on what you're doing right now. And I challenge them. I say, when I was 14, I started reading the word seriously. And I didn't understand a lot of it. Even though I grew up in a Christian home and had parents that taught me and had good Sunday school teachers and we had excellent local brethren who really were men of the word and taught the word well. There was still a lot I didn't know for myself. And I asked the Lord, teach me from your word and bring people into my life that will teach me the word. And the Lord's just continued to do that right up to this very day. But it was something that nobody had to go grab me by the collar. I wanted it. And I had that reputation as being a kid who wants a ride to the conference. I want to go to any conference I could, any Bible study, anything that was happening with Christians and the word. I wanted to be there. And, and thankfully, in the time when I was growing up, there was a lot of that around. And that is having its fruit in my life to this very day. But there's a lot of other kids I found out that aren't like me, you know, that you're going to need to bring them along. You're going to need to go out to them. They're not going to come to you asking for it. You're going to need to say to them, not in a scary way, like, hey, kid, if you don't get into the Bible now, your life's going to be a wreck. No, but say, hey, I've been enjoying something in the word here. Let me show this to you. And what would you think about it? We just got together once a week, you know, once in a while. Uh, even if once a week can't happen due to schedules. Let's get together. Let's go to a donut shop or something and, and uh, just look at a passage of scripture together. And you start teaching them how to read the word, not just read the words on the page, but what to look for, how to break down things. And start giving young men in particular a chance to get involved, a chance to get up and lead singing maybe. They might not be able to sing but it's something to get them. I remember when I was like 15, 16, the brethren had me up song leading. And I'm not Pavarotti, okay? And I'm not a musician like Brother Kevin is. I've always loved music. And I'm not a terrible singer either. But I wasn't up there because I knew anything. But when I was up there giving out these hymns, there was a very um, experienced Bible teacher. He was in his 80s. And he was sitting in the audience, and he said to my dad after the meeting, just listening to me 
give out the hymns at the beginning, he said to my dad, that boy has gift. He said, that boy is going to be a teacher of the word. He could just tell how I was handling myself at the platform. And I didn't know. I wasn't, you know, I was just up there doing what came naturally, so to speak. But already the Lord was showing in the assembly what he had put in me, what he wanted to develop. And thankfully, I was in a place where the brethren didn't discourage me. They encouraged me. And anything I wanted to do for the Lord, they got behind me and they helped me. And some of them had weekly Bible studies with me and took time to answer my questions or lent me books or in some cases gave me books. And it meant all the difference in the world, brethren. And I'm really, I'm convicted about my own home assembly now. There's people I'm thinking about and I've been praying about, Lord, how do I build these young people up? You know, how do I do what I'm preaching? <laughs> what was done for me? And so may God help you. A lot of you don't travel. A lot of you are in a local church and that's the focus of your work for the Lord mainly. I'm in a situation where I itinerate a lot. So in a way, I'm more restricted to some of this. I can't do it as well as some of you will. But this needs to be done. We need to pass on the truth. And so I, I share that with you. Are we at the time of a break right now? I oh, know we're at the time of group discussion. Tell you what, let's take five. I mean five, okay? <laughs> let's take five. If you need the bathroom, hit it quickly. And then we'll come back and you can give your country.